Welcome everyone to season two, episode 76 of the Premier Pod. I'm your host, Yash Bika, joined by my co-host, Tyler Chan. In this episode, we are joined by another special guest, Lizzie Becherano, who has covered DC United for SB Nation um, for the past couple of years. She re- just recently graduated from George Washington, so we had a great chat with her. She's also a big Liverpool fan. We talked about her experiences covering the MLS, covering Wayne Rooney, her experiences meeting a couple famous Liverpool players such as Stevie G. Uh, so you definitely want to stick around and hear her thoughts about the overall process at Liverpool right now. Um, just her stories about meeting these players and covering Wayne Rooney and some of her um, favorite memories covering DC United. We had an excellent chat with her. And yeah, it was just a super fun time and super fun conversation with her. Mm-hmm. She was super cool. And it was great having another Liverpool supporter <laughs> on the pod. So this is definitely one to listen to for the Liverpool fans, at least. <laughs> but we also want to give a shout out and a thank you to the Twitter users, uh, Chris Wood and Luis Friedman for submitting some questions. We had those answered by Lizzie as well on the pod. Yeah, definitely appreciate the love and support from you guys. But yeah, enjoy the interview. Okay, guys. Um, So we have Lizzie on chat with us. Uh, Thank you so much for taking the time to um, talk with us. I know uh, with all the quarantine and just everything that's been going on with coronavirus has been a little tough. But, you know, if you don't know about Lizzie, she uh, currently served as the DC United beat writer for SB Nation. And she's a huge, passionate Liverpool supporter. Um, So I don't know how I feel about that as a Manchester United fan, but I know Tyler's pretty happy. Another Liverpool fan to kind of gang up on me but um yeah with that how are you doing lizzie hi guys thank you so much for having me i'm honored i'm doing well given the news that the premier league is starting up again i am thrilled something to watch in terms of liverpool and we're gonna be crowned soon so i could not be up here (laughs) awesome awesome and um if you don't mind we're just gonna go ahead and kind of jump into those questions but you know, my first question comes, you know, how did you kind of get to your position where you were covering uh, DC United for SB Nation and, you know, going to their home games and just being like, you know, that type of beat writer for them uh, for SB Nation? Of course. So I started my DC journey in 2016 when I enrolled into the George Washington University. And being from a Hispanic family and obviously growing up in South Florida, soccer has always just been very relevant in my life. And going to college, I wanted that same athletic atmosphere, and GW does not have any of that. So I figured I would have to go into the MLS atmosphere, and I started going to DC United games, and it was just, it was so wonderful to see and be exposed to the MLS. And from that, I started reading fan posts, blogs, and just little things because NBC Sports doesn't really have extensive DC United coverage which I thought shocking but so I found other back channels Mm -hmm. and I stumbled upon Black and Red United and just absolutely loved their coverage it was in depth fresh and just very unique in the way of writing I started following the editors on Twitter in hopes to get news and exclusives and I reached out to Jason who is one of the um, editors of the site. And I was very fortunate in in that he was just very welcoming. So I reached out. I asked if I could be a contributor as a fan and as someone who had been watching the team for close to two years at that point. And he very much welcomed the opportunity, allowed me to get to know everybody, um, welcomed me into the Slack channels. And so we went to have coffee one day and... I just happened to be very enthusiastic and very, I guess, not overachiever, but I want to achieve certain goals. And I had set to myself that I wanted to cover a game from the press box while in college. So I started talking to Jason and it happened, very luckily for me, that their in-game reporter position was open because the previous person had left, um, I guess, graduated or something, but had left the position. And he allowed me to kind of try out because it happened to be preseason. So he asked me to cover a couple preseason games to see if it would work out. And it did. So 
I was very fortunate to have that position for a little over a year and a half and attend every game, cover it from the press box, and then every away game I just would watch from my computer and type away. <laughs> nice. Um, and kind of just like a, a follow up for that, what is, do you have a favorite story that you've written, um, you know, for the SB Nation site for DC United? I do. Um, it happens to be my most recent story about the Peruvian community in DC. Mm-hmm. So usually I did in-game summaries and like I would report four or five minutes after the game would end, my summary would be up on the site. And while it's thrilling, absolutely thrilling to be on, be inside the press box and cover everything minute by minute, um, this past story allowed me to experience a different side of the community and a different side of DC United. Um, Edison Flores, he played in Mexico, so he was wonderful to talk to. And the team allowed me to get 35 minutes with him and alone in a room. So we just talked away and it was amazing to hear his side and the proving communities just speaking volumes about him and their support for DC United. And while doing the story, I think it was it was coverage that hadn't really been highlighted before. And though they, the Proving community are such a great presence at Audi Field, they hadn't really been given the spotlight. And so they told me that on several occasions and I just felt so grateful to be given the opportunity to give them the light and allow them to speak about the team and the player and, and how much they just love DC in general. Being the Premier Pod, we're always also wondering about you know, Premier League interactions and how it can also be brought over from other leagues. And Wayne Rooney, he is key figure for DC United. And we're wondering from your perspective, was he treated as like a celebrity while he was there or did he just kind of blend in and he was just one of those behind the scenes kind of players? I think his personality was more behind the scenes. Every time I was in the locker room or heard about a certain situation, he was the calmest guy in the room. He was fine. He welcomed every reporter. He never demanded the star treatment. And I, going into the situation, thought it would be different. I thought he would be and act like the star player that he is. Yes, as a <laughs> Liverpool supporter, I will recognize his talent. <laughs> but I had this assumption of him that he would be a leader in the negative term in that he would crave the spotlight because he had it in Europe. But mm. no, um, every time I would be there, he would just be completely aware of the little guy in the room or... For example, one of my first interactions with with him is he allowed me to ask a question, and I think it was like my second game that he gave me that opportunity. He had no idea who I was. None of the reporters had any idea who I was, and I wasn't coming in as a big shot reporter. I was literally standing in the back, so I think he has that type of personality. However, given his position, it is only natural that every reporter would go and want to ask him a question after the game so the team set up a back kind of interview area outside of the locker room so that everybody would be comfortable while all the reporters swarmed around him to ask him (laughs) any type of question but that was completely not required or asked for by Rooney it was a team decision and comfort was a priority rather than ego or anything like that so it was just a wonderful experience to interview him and interact with him in a not so diva way <laughs> that that's pretty cool because i obviously obviously a manchester united fan i'm a huge wayne rooney fan i you know i obviously adore what he how he plays and the goals he scores one of my favorite i guess moments with wayne rooney at dc united was that one um i can't remember if it was a playoff game but it was one of those it was the game where he basically um, he tracked back all the way from like his own, you know, his own, you know, from his own like penalty box, tracked all the way back to the midfield line, won the ball back and just hit an absolute beauty of a long ball. And they end up scoring, I think, a game winner off that. And it was, you know, it was on Sports Center top 10. It was like all over the Internet, even the Premier League. And, you know, people from England were starting to catch, get a, catch, a glimpse of it. Um, you know, 
what was he i mean what was i don't know if you got to cover that game but if you did what was he like you know in the locker room after that game or after that moment was he just kind of the same chill wayne rooney or was he just you know what did he have some type of different vibe to him after the game um during the post game interviews unfortunately i don't think i was at that particular game mm-hmm. however every time he would make a game changing goal or action or pass and the team would win he would celebrate with everybody. He would never take it upon himself to say, I'm the winner, I'm the star. Even in every single interview, any reporter would ask him about that moment and think like, you're the star, how do you feel? And every answer pertained to the team as a whole. He was very big on sharing the win and not blaming anybody when they lost. So Mm -hmm. it was very much just a team effort, even though there were some games where he contributed 90% to the goals or 90% to the game as a whole. It was a shared victory and a shared loss, which I thought was wonderful coming from him. Nice, nice. Dang, because good guy Wayne Rooney, that's that's big (laughs) for for Yosh. He's like, now he knows in the back of his head, he's like, all right, one of the people I look up to is a good guy confirmed. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's not like that hot. I don't know yeah. about any of his actions or the rumors or because there's always one story being written about him, but I can say on and off the field, he is a great teammate. I obviously can't speak as a actual teammate, but covering him is, is a good experience. He was never rude to me, at least he was never rude. He was always welcoming and always paid attention to some people that he didn't have to pay attention to. So Yes, you can continue adoring him. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, well, yeah, Todd, go ahead. I had some questions because this is also one of the first times we've had another Liverpool supporter on the podcast. So I was just buzzing. <laughs> I was like, yes, finally. <laughs> and I had some questions for you because uh, we noticed on your Twitter that you have quite a few pictures with former Liverpool players like notable ones such as Steven Gerrard, current players such as Jordan Henderson. You, know, you also had Felipe Coutinho in there. And I was wondering, how did you meet all these players? <laughs> That's crazy. You did crazy. Some really good research there because they're about, I think, five or six years old. Um, <laughs> but no, so they happened to come to Miami for, I think it was International Champions Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, and they happened to come to Miami and I had a friend working in the hospitality industry and she texted me and said hey listen I think your team is staying at the hotel (laughs) and so she gave me some tips and tricks on how to be at that hotel at a certain time um and I happened to show up and everyone there every single player was wonderful um I remember with Stevie I asked him for a picture and of course he said yes he signed the book um because I bought his biography, he signed that, and when I hugged him, <laughs> I think I was shaking so hard. <laughs> and then he turned to me and he was like, "Are are you okay? Like, will you be okay?" <laughs> and I was like, "You know what? I will never be better." <laughs> and I don't know how he took that, but he was just wonderful. <laughs> it was me and like two other people signed their jerseys answered questions he was amazing and it was funny because at the moment obviously we were big fans of Raheem Sterling and he also signed hugged took pictures and whatnot but I was still in the lobby when I tweeted that picture and he was I want to say six seven feet away from me like not facing me and I tweeted it and he liked it right away. And I was laughing. Oh. I'm like, we're so close to each other. Like, you, I could just tell you it's me who tweeted that. But I don't know. I just, I found that story to be really funny because he was standing right there and he still liked my tweet and he was right there. That's okay. incredible. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, that- yeah, that was one time. And then the second time was just when I went to a Liverpool game and it was my first Anfield experience. And I asked one of the ushers there how I could meet Stevie because obviously I, I thought they would tell me. And <laughs> and he actually, he was very nice. I told him it was my birthday, which it was. So he was very nice. And he told me that after the game to wait about like 35 minutes or so and stand by the player's entrance because they would 
like sign autographs there sometimes after the game and it was Tyler you'll remember this it was I want to say 2016 to no 2015 2016 the 2-2 draw against Aston Villa where Suarez got injured oh. horrible game obviously I had to go to that one but I did stand in the players entrance they did say happy birthday Daniel Sturridge apologized to me which was my crowning moment because <laughs> I know, I know. I told well, I told him that I came all the way from Miami to watch them play and that it was a dream come true. And he was like, I'm so sorry we couldn't deliver something better for you. And I was like, Listen, you just did. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was sweet. It was sweet. Man, Daniel Sturridge. Top lad. <laughs> how 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 was that experience going to Anfield? Uh like the pre like what what was it like going, you know, pre game, actually going to the game, after the game meeting, you know, storage and then just the post-match feels of going to Anfield wow um it was magical honestly (laughs) it was quite the journey um it was a it was rainy day it wasn't nice at all and I remember at halftime being in a bad mood because they were they were losing but it was just a surreal experience I I didn't sit in the cop unfortunately but I sang as loud as I can, you'll never walk alone. And I kid you not, I am a very emotional person, but I kid you not, tears were streaming down my face as if I had just made it in that moment. And unfortunately, I haven't been back, but I hope next season I will be. Nice, nice. Man, I do too, because like, I still haven't actually been to Anfield. I've been to one Liverpool game, and that's when they came to on an international cup as well to North Carolina and they played at the bank of America stadium. And the only person I really met from the team was at the time, the team physio. And I just ran into <laughs> it like the CBS. I got a, I got a picture with them, but I was like, man, I wish I got a photo. And then I saw you got photos of like so many players. I was like, dang, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, Tyler, what was he picking up at the CBS? I don't know. I didn't really check what aisle he was like really going towards. I was just, we're, I don't, I forgot why we were even in there. I think we were getting snacks or something, but we just we were walking around and we saw him just down the, the aisle and we we're like, isn't that the physio? And then we we're like, I think so. And then we asked him and he's like, yes, that's me. And then we, we snapped a photo, but that was the only time besides me taking a selfie from like the nosebleed seat. <laughs> with me and Steven Gerrard <laughs> when he was on the pitch. So <laughs> that's the closest interaction I've had. But dang, now I really want to go to Anfield because, you know, we've had other guests on that have told us, you know, their experiences at other places or other stadiums, such as the Emirates or the Camp Now. And, you know, we've been told sometimes the atmosphere is a little overrated or a little oversaturated on TV. And sometimes it's just kind of dead silent. But for you, it was very like a magical experience, which is, very uh, hopeful for me because I'm thinking I was like man Anfield I feel like would be kind of different because every time I see it at least it's like just booming yeah I mean I've been to a couple in Europe luckily I went to Camp Nou um Paris Saint-Germain I went to a game there and the first they are massive stadiums like massive massive um El Azteca too in Mexico massive stadiums so Given that Anfield is relatively small in comparison, it's a bit of a shock because you're so close to everybody. Mm -hmm. The the, um, traveling fans as well, like you're so close to everybody that it's hard not to interact. But yeah, Anfield, obviously as a Liverpool supporter, will always have sentiment and emotion there. But it really just was a very different feel from any of the other massive stadiums that I had been to and Liverpool as a team is just extremely special so there's no way it could be a flat experience for anybody I think but especially if you're a Liverpool supporter I just don't think that anybody could go and not feel absolute magic hey so hear that (laughs) yes we're going next season and (laughs) and you'll feel Uh, the magic too as a Man U fan (laughs) <laughs> I'll have to put a I'll have to put a hoodie on so I don't get beat up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by me. <laughs> but oh, I was also wondering because this is something that 
since you've had, you know, some experiences with Liverpool players and I'm pretty sure you know a lot about the team as well. There's always been transfer talks about, you know, Timo Werner coming in or Kai Havertz possibly coming in or Jaden Sancho. But there's so many players I feel like in the academy that the Klopp has been looking into and there's been a lot of buzz around them. So, you know, like Trent Alexander-Arnold, do you think there will be eventually another player from the academy, maybe in one in particular, that you think will possibly be in the starting 11 soon or maybe on the bench? I just don't think in the starting 11 at the moment. I think it's hard to break into that. Mm -hmm. Even as a transfer, I think it's such a well-oiled machine that Klopp has built that, I mean, this season or what's left from it, I just don't think so. And given the unusual circumstances I don't think the transfer window will be an accurate representation of what a normal one would be like and so I think both the team and the market is going to have to adjust so I think the team will stay relatively similar I think maybe one or two players will come in and maybe shake up the training ground I don't think they'll make it quite into the starting 11 as for an academy player, at the moment, I just don't think so. I don't think it's because they're not good enough or they're not training enough or because Klopp won't give them a chance. I just think this is a really, really hard team to break into at the moment. It's kind of like last season winning the Premier League. It's not that Liverpool was bad. They lost. They literally lost one game. It's just that the standards were so high, so unusually high, that... Mm-hmm it was impossible to break into it. So I think last year's Premier League chase will mirror any academy player's will to break into that starting 11, even break into the bench, essentially. What do you think, though? That's a good point, because I didn't even really think about how the transfer window is going to shake up this summer in particular, because now we're going to be basically, it looks like we'll be playing some games during it. So that'll be interesting because usually the summer transfer window is a time to rebuild or kind of add on to the momentum from the previous season and there has been some discussions at least i've seen on like on twitter and things like that where possibly certain players that Klopp are looking into are curtis jones uh, ram brewster of course is at swansea currently on loan and he's always very high praise from Klopp. And then also just Keanu Hoover, he's like 17 years old. I, I don't know what the plan is for him, but I was in Chicago um, a few months ago and I listened in on a live podcast there from uh, Anfield, like some, like the Reds. It was, it was, I forgot the name, it escapes from me, but they're talking about Keanu Hoover in there and they're kind of giving him a little high praise. And I was thinking, hmm, I didn't even really think about that. So I do know as well that certain players probably are going to be on their way out, like Adam Alana, possibly Shakiri as well. And someone else is going to have to take their spots. And that's why I was wondering, hmm, I wonder what your take is on who do you think would come in and possibly fill that kind of void? I just think it's hard to say at the moment because everything is so shaken up. Mm-hmm. So since it's not normal circumstances, there's no clear path or no clear view into what the team wants to do or what the team feels they need to change or fix. Um, I, I just think it's really hard from the outside to look into what their plans might be. I think they have some great talent in the Academy. I think they have some great players on loan and in terms of prospects, I think any sane player around the world would want to go into (laughs) Liverpool. I, I just don't see someone saying no. Mm-hmm. Um, given the team, the prestige, the history, and the manager, like I just don't see someone saying no to that in terms of development. However, I think it's very hard and maybe early to tell what their transfer plans or starting 11 plans might be. Yeah, because literally this is, at least in my opinion, the best team in the world right now. <laughs> so... I mean, mine too. Unbiased. <laughs> so there we go. It's like, how do you improve on 
near perfection. It's like no, it's just... you don't. No. <laughs> but I, I think um, I would say this: the 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 reason Sir Alex Ferguson seems because I I read his like biog- biography, um, his book, and one of the things he always said that you know every time they won, he would always try to look to improve or find a way to challenge the squad, and that's kind of what pushed the squad to be so good for as long as it did. Um, and kind of keeping that same sentiment in mind, uh, Lizzie, if uh, if everything was normal, who would kind of be your dream signing for Liverpool to kind of make? Um, obviously, it seems like I, I don't want to put like a hundred like a that's just a pinball on it, but it seems like Timo Werner will probably end up coming to Liverpool at some point. But if you had anyone else in mind besides Timo Werner, was it was is there a dream signing that you would love to make if everything was just normal in Liverpool? You know, the season just kind of played out normally and Liverpool won the title normally and, you know, they have all this cash to spend. Like, who would be your person if you were the board, if you're the director to just go out and buy? That is a tough question. <laughs> um, I don't really know at the moment. I think I'm so used to this team and watching them meld together so well that it's hard for me to think about someone entering and kind of switching it up. Um, I just, I don't know. I like the starting 11 so much and I like what they've been doing this season so much that I don't, I currently don't know a player that could go in and just swiftly take over someone's spot and do it without any time of adjustment which says something about the team and the fact that I am currently so spoiled to watch Liverpool this way but, <laughs> yeah I don't know Tyler how about you it's it is really hard because it's it's a very particular system that Klopp instilled over the past several seasons because like certain players when he brought them in it was just like hmm that's a that was a little interesting to bring in like like one album, I would never think he was going to be like such a star center mid. And then Sadio Mane and Salah, of course, we, we knew they were good, but we didn't know they're going to be, you know, player of the year level. Right. So I think it really has to do with the system. And I think the reason why certain players like Kai Havertz in particular is being linked is because I feel like he's kind of like Firmino in a sense where he could play as like an out center forward, but also he can drop back and play midfield so i i would probably pick kai havertz because although timo warner is would bring a whole nother dynamic to the squad i don't know it's just like i feel like he's too much of a forward <laughs> it's, it's, that's kind of <laughs> right. weird to say and i feel like kai havertz is a little bit more dynamic but if i were to just throw all logic out the window i'd pick deep <laughs> <laughs> because you know i feel like it's just that'd be really interesting it'd just be one of those players that every once in a while, I'm not gonna lie, their creativity during some points in certain points of the season was a little lacking at times, and we we're kind of um, getting by with some scrappy wins. And I was just thinking, it's like, man, if we had like a Coutinho or something like that, no, no, uh, left foot. no, no, <laughs> not Coutinho, no, no, or <laughs> like a player similar, no, someone who can... a different name, please. <laughs> Keita, what about that? <laughs> okay, okay, I'll take it. A healthy Keita. Uh, exactly. Yeah, so someone who can unlock a defense and kind You're of unleash right. all, Salah. I, all I'm right. hearing is you need Fellaini and you just need to play no. a striker. No. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> You're <laughs> You're doing long balls to Fellaini. <laughs> but yeah, I would oh, say man. either Dybala or Kai Havertz. So that'd be my picks. Interesting. Nice. Nice. Mm-hmm. All right, if uh, we're just going to go ahead and transition to uh, – we have two questions from fans. Um, one – our first one is from Chris WWFC Wood. He is a Wolves fan. And his question is, how has financial fair play helped but also hindered clubs? So coming from a Wolves fan, this is a pretty interesting perspective. Hmm. I mean, I think it levels out the playing field. A little bit. I mm-hmm. I mean, I can't say I'm against it. I think <laughs> smaller teams should deserve a law like that. I don't Do you, know. I'm kind of just thinking about like Man City and how they suffer from it. And I, I, I would guess maybe like rephrase it in a sense. 
would you like to see maybe European clubs adapt a MLS style of a salary cap? Because I know that's a very, very popular thing to do in the U.S. is to have salary caps where you kind of limit the amount of spending or the amount of money a team can pour into players. And that way, kind of in 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 essence, it kind of helps levels out, you know, who you can sign and all that. Would you prefer to see a system like that be adopted in the European style to maybe balance out the playing field in terms of big big name players or do you like the way it has been where it's just kind of like if you have the money you are free to spend it on whatever you want um I would say neither here nor there I don't think I would adopt it word by word however I do think the prices of certain players have been astronomical with no reason to be like Cautinho, for example, should not have been sold at the price he was sold at. I'm sorry. He, <laughs> at, no, at the, at that point, I was full Cautinho, biggest supporter. He was part of the Liverpool family. Like, he was amazing. And even so, should not have been sold at that price. But Barcelona has the money to do so. So, in that isolated incident, you say, well, okay, Barcelona has the money to do so, and they will. But... If you jack up the price one time, essentially everything will rise to a, to a point where smaller teams can't even become competitive. Mm-hmm. However, you have a, the other side who says that's when you bring in a world-class manager who can thrive from what he has. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know, like Jurgen Klopp wasn't given FC Barcelona's lineup or Real Madrid's lineup, and he absolutely made the most of what he was given. And I think, to a certain extent, he proves that money isn't everything when it comes to football. So capping it at one certain price I don't think would be the way to go. However, limiting or observing the prices so that inflation doesn't play a huge role in the transfer market, if that makes sense. Again, neither here nor there. Yes. So we have another question from Twitter from Luis Friedman. And he says, hi, Lizzie. What do you think about Klopp? Do you think he can stay at Liverpool in the long term? And I feel like based on some of your answers so far, I think I know where this might be going. (laughs) And I probably will have a similar reaction. So uh, you answer this. (laughs) Easy question. I love Klopp. I commend him for all the brilliant things he's done with the players for injecting a fresh new energy to Liverpool. I, I mean, okay. I loved Brendan Rogers, met him as well in Miami. He was wonderful, super kind. And I think what he achieved with the team was wonderful, but I think the season afterwards, the peak, um, it became sort of stale. Um, that's kind of why also I commend Luis Suarez for leaving when he did, because he realized the energy was still at Liverpool and that he had achieved with the team what he was supposed to. And when Klopp came in, I thought, is this revolutionary new mind coming into a historic club? So you kind of get a clash of the old and the new. And I was very surprised the owners were welcoming that opportunity for some new rock and roll football I thought it was definitely going to be an experience, good or bad. I thought it was going to be a great new shakeup. And obviously it's proven successful. I think he's he's a wonderful mastermind in football. And above all, I think his most valuable contribution is the fact that he himself is a fan. Not only of Liverpool or players, but of the game. So he sees it not only from a financial and technical standpoint, he truly loves the game and wants to see it thrive, just as any supporter of any team would want to. So watching his celebrations on the sidelines, watching him thrive and celebrate with the players, you really feel like you are part of him or he reflects a part of you on those sidelines. And I think as a manager that is so valuable because you don't want a serious you don't want a serious person representing a team that is so full of passion, history and emotion like Liverpool. And I think he fully impersonates everything that the team is. 
from a fan emotional standpoint and then I think he just understands the game so beautifully that he has managed managed to manipulate the lineup to work like a machine Mm -hmm. I totally agree it's just when I saw him come in I was thinking how on earth do we get him (laughs) what a a perfect signing because um I also watch Dortmund every once in a while here and there and I followed him when he was at Dortmund I was like man I really wish he came to Liverpool because, you know, I did notice that under Brendan Rodgers near the end of his era, it did get stale. It's like, man, we really need something just to, like, get exciting, like, just to excite the crowd, like, just get some kind of emotion back in. And, you know, Klopp, he has proven in the in the Bundesliga, at least, that he can find success, but it was kind of unproven in the Premier League. And it was it was a bit of a risk, but I I was just thinking, I was like, you know what? We've gone through so much already. It's like, what's more? <laughs> I, I mean, I watched the Bundesliga this past weekend and the past weekend before that. But I'm just like, man, it's not the Premier League, though. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, I hadn't really been into the German League personally. Um, mm-hmm. I hadn't really watched that much of it before. Obviously, I know the teams and whatnot. But I also found it funny because I created like a 101 introduction of which team you should support. Like, everyone hopped on that trend on Twitter. <laughs> it was fun to watch. It it was fun. Again, obviously not the Premier League. But I I don't know. Do you think it'll be the same thing when the Premier League comes up that the players will be not at their best shape? Because I'm kind of seeing that with everybody in the Bundesliga. It's just not at the same level. And it's excusable, mm-hmm. obviously, because we've all been just sitting on the couch. But I don't know. I don't know if it'll be the same for the Premier League. The stigma that possibly that the title might be overshadowed by just how weird the season has been now because of Corona. But I think it will be not by mm-hmm. Liverpool supporters, but I don't want to say the word like haters because <laughs> it's so <laughs> juvenile. But I think by opposing teams, I think. If given coronavirus or not, I think regardless of what would have happened, people would have found a reason to criticize Liverpool or to credit winning the Premier League on something else. Yeah, I think so too. And I was of our team. <laughs> <laughs> you got to protect them. Okay. But I will say, I mean, based on current pro- uh, trajectory, I feel like Liverpool are pretty much favorites for the next season too. So. If anything, if you go back to back, it's going to be like, well, you proved it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, next season, I think I think it's going to be on a curve, too, because the transfer window and obviously the effects of Corona are going to be long lasting. But if we could win it next season, I think we would shut everybody up. Yeah, I think so. Honestly. We just need to do that. <laughs> we just, <laughs> oh, my. I'm just so... I'm just so also wondering, like, will the season start on time as well? Because that could also play a factor since they're starting a little later. But I don't know, there's a lot of questions. I don't, I want to say yes, but then you hear researchers claim a second wave of coronavirus. So Mm -hmm. obviously we can never be too sure of what's going to happen. But if, everyone stays inside, wears a mask, and continues to be as healthy as possible without a second wave, I think it could potentially start, I don't know if on time, but maybe just a week, two weeks later, which I would be fine with because I already think it ending in May is very boring. Because <laughs> around. So now it'll just be nonstop? I would be okay with that. Yeah, I would too. I would, I would be opposed to to non-stop soccer i really wouldn't no complaints for me (laughs) (laughs) it might be a little tiring for the players but at least for the fans it'd be like yes yeah like seven games a week like come on (laughs) seven games a week (laughs) because i watched um a video i think it was seven games with the current schedule starting in june i think it might be seven games a week Uh, like not for each team obviously but i do think it is seven games a week no Oh, I think I found the schedule you're talking about. And yeah, yeah. it looks like it. I think it might oh. be one on Monday, two on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. So two on Tuesday through Thursday. Right. One on Friday. Oh, 
oh my <laughs> and then i think it was like six over the weekend no yeah it looks like it yeah okay so i'm not crazy I mean, it is more than more or less seven games a week I, I wanted to quickly ask this question when it comes to Klopp. do you think lizzie that if he wins the premier league will he be held as the sir alex ferguson that manchester united have um will he be held to that same ilk for liverpool if he ends up capturing a Premier League, because he's already won the Champions League. Um, I don't love comparisons in terms of names, because I think mm-hmm. each individual brings something special to each team. But I do think yeah. Liverpool will hold Klopp in a certain shelf, like a championship shelf. I think beyond his contributions in terms of titles, I think it's more of like what he brought to the club and what morals ethics values and styles he brought to the team so yeah I think he will definitely be recognized and remembered as a revolutionary manager I don't know if just like Sir Alex Ferguson but I do think he will never be forgotten in Liverpool's history I think it was nice his announcement and his welcoming back was just revolutionary it was a new era for liverpool um but yeah uh yeah thank you guys so thank you lizzie so much for coming on especially dealing with the huge technical issue we had um but we definitely do appreciate the insight you shared with uh covering dc united um and you know just your interaction with liverpool players and your overall thoughts about the premier league and such we really do appreciate it but Guys, make sure to follow Lizzie on Twitter. I believe, is it Lizzie underscore uh, Betrano on Twitter? Okay, yeah. Please give her a follow. Um, she's great. She re- writes some great stories and just to hear some Liverpool banter here and there. But yeah, keep up to date with her on Twitter, follow her. And yeah, we'll definitely look forward to it. Thank you so much, Lizzie, Thank for you. coming on. Thank you so much on. for having me. It's wonderful. You guys do some excellent things. Love the Liverpool banter. <laughs> Josh, I forgive <laughs> you for being a Manchester supporter. It's it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I've heard that from uh, too many people to count. Definitely Arsenal fans, Chelsea fans, just like all over fans around we the world. So I, I think I'm getting used to it. <laughs> but thank you so much, no, Lizzie. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you so much um, for listening to Season 2, Episode 76. Uh, We had a great chat with Lizzie. Um, Please make sure to rate, comment, subscribe. Tell us what you like, what you don't like. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Premier Pod. Uh, We make custom graphics on there. And, you know, that's kind of where you can hear some more behind-the-scenes stuff of what we're doing. And we just want to hear from you guys. Um, Any topics, any questions, please send them to us. We will answer them. Um, So, yeah, thank you guys so much for the support. And that kind of does it for us for Season 2, Episode 76. Thank you, guys. Peace. Peace.